Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Lars Christensen, and welcome to live stream number 106. Yeah, it seems like there's a long time till the next milestone. Happy Friday, everyone. We made it, man. Fifth live stream of the week. Absolutely awesome. Appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, join this one. We are talking all about CAM. If you're not into CAM, take the day off, get on beer early. Rest of us, well, we just gonna might have to uh, hang on for uh, for a little bit more. So today, is all today, 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 today is all about Cam. Um, we are going to uh, machine with Cam uh, this um, egg holder type. This was a request I got from uh, from somebody a while back. Uh, how you would go about uh, machining like these curves and stuff like that. Um, for, uh, well, they said an egg holder, so kind of like an, an egg shape like that. And just uh, just to add a little bit to it, yesterday I got my Haas simulator uh, up and running, and it's actually right now, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, probably can't. It's actually simulating the G-code for about the part we're going we're gonna to model today. So, I don't know, not really worth much, but I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, before we get into all the cam. Um, there was just a couple of things I wanted to point out with uh, this model here. I started this model because people sometimes ask me later on what the heck is going on. So I started this model like I would have done with many models with importing a picture I found on Google. And uh, then I modeled up um, kind of a, uh, a golden egg. Now what I wanted to point out about this egg is if we go and look at the sketch, because somebody asked me about this the other day. Uh, this is a spline, so I used the Revolve function, we've covered that one before. This is a spline. Look, this spline is fully defined. So you can absolutely fully define uh, splines. So I put horizontal relationships, vertical relationships, and dimensions, and for, for, for the rest of it. So just wanted to make sure that I cover that. Um, I sometimes cheat and I just right click on the spline instead of dimension it and fix it. But you should absolutely either fix it or fully define uh, the spline. So I just wanna make sure that uh, I set that. Um, now for this part here, we actually don't need the egg, but I use the combine remove function to make the shape inside of, uh, of the block here. So let's just hide the egg for a second because this is the part that we are going to, uh, to be machining, kind of like applying some, some tool path on. And I want to say this too, before I, I get too far into applying the toolpath. Um, I want to kind of like go through this how, with some different tips and tricks on how I would um, maybe machine this um, and show some tips and tricks within each kind of toolpath. If you're brand new and it goes a little bit fast, don't forget you can rewind. Um, if you are more experienced with CAM, and if you get through this entire next 30, 20, 30 minutes, and you knew everything I showed you, you should pat yourself on the back. Then I think you, you're pretty, you're pretty good with CAD. Or with CAM. Maybe also with CAD. I don't know. It's Friday, folks. I'm going to tell you. So, um, yeah, I just... And, and let me know in the comment area if this type of videos are good, where we just kind of like go through applying toolpath and kind of just, you know, stumble over different cases, scenarios. I could think that this might be useful. Enough talking. We are going to jump from the model environment to CAM. Okay. I'm going to do all this in, uh, in metric, uh, though I have to admit that the code that is running on the simulator is in inches. Uh, I didn't switch that over. So we're just going to start out with a, uh, a job setup. Um, and I have covered this in previous uh, live streams. So I'm not going to spend too much time in here. I always use select Z plane. And I'm just going to select it to the top. And uh, for a part like this, I would actually place my origin right at the top. And I always prefer to use an indicator to find the center of my block and work from that. I'm not saying that's the right way, that's just how I used to do it. Uh, we do have a little bit of stock here. We have stock and one millimeter on the sides and one millimeter on the top. Um, but I'm not really gonna necessarily try to make this the uh, completely finished tutorials. I'm more interested in giving you some knowledge within the different tool paths. So hit OK to that, and we applied our, our first setup. Um, 
Now, the first tool pair that we normally will go ahead and apply many times, I should say, is a facing tool path. Uh, click facing tool path, select a tool, and uh, I'm just gonna go down to, uh, and like I said, use the tutorial metric. So you all have these, we can select the face mill, hit uh, okay, and um, when we've done that, I'm not gonna worry about feats and speeds in this live stream. Um, go over to the geometry tab, but like I said before, with the facing operation, it finds the boundary box, that's that orange one, so let's just hit okay, and, uh, and we have now a facing operation, right? So uh, nothing too fancy here, hit the simulation button, hit the play button, uh, we are now kind of like decking up the top. This is probably how, you know, most people would normally have done uh, this kind of facing operation. Nothing really exciting here. Many people have asked me, is it possible to instead of using a facing operation, let me highlight that and hit delete, couldn't we use the 2D adaptive? Because if we use the 2D adaptive, uh, we are getting a uh, constant step over. That's the cool thing about adaptive, right? That it, it takes the part you're gonna machine and the stock and it makes sure that it keeps a constant load on the cutter. Yes, we can absolutely use 2D adaptive as a facing operation and it's not really a bad idea uh, to do that. Now this part here is a rectangle, so facing might still be the better one, but if you have like an, a weird looking shape part, 2D adaptive can actually be pretty good. Let me show you how you face with 2D adaptive if you've never seen that before. Click uh, on your 2D adaptive tool path. Let's go ahead and select a tool. Select the tool in here. And I'm gonna go back down to my English, my metric library. I'm gonna select this uh, 16 millimeter flat end mill. Let's hit okay to that. Man, that default out has a lot of flute link on it. That's a little ridiculous. Did you notice in the latest release, if you right click and hit edit tool, that uh, the awesome developers got a, a better picture in here. Now you can actually modify, you can actually see uh, what these different things are. are. Makes life a little bit uh, easier uh, to kind of like, if you ever wondered what the different values were. So, you know, thumbs up to the development team. Now it's, uh, 25 millimeters, like probably a little bit more uh, realistic size for for a cutter uh, like this. I wouldn't have it sticking that far of the tool. Okay, back to uh, 2D Adaptive. Now, in the geometry tab for 2D Adaptive, you are normally used to check edges. That's what I always uh, preach. But when it comes to a facing operation, then uh, select the face. I'm going to click on this and I'm going to hit OK. And you will actually see, this works great if you have a flat face, but you will actually see that the tool does some really weird movements because we have these uh, egg openings, right? So um, because we selected the face, it avoids that. Well, we haven't machined those yet, and I kind of like wanted to go over those too. Uh, so, you know, we, we, need something, we need something better than this. Well, here's a neat trick. Go back into Adaptive, right click and Edit. Go back into your Geometry tab and turn on Stock Contours. This means that we actually will be using the edges of the model instead, and you can actually also use sketches, instead of what we predefined in our setup. Now check it out now. So now we have a lot better tool pad. Now again, I said before, you know, for speed and stuff like that, for a rectangular block like this, um, you know, and standard facing operation might be a little bit better. But the cool thing about this is that we get now, on this case here, a constant step over. Uh, it's calculating that constant step over on the, the facing operation. This looks really great if you have somewhat like a, um, a round part or, um, or something like that. Okay. So that was facing as an adaptive. Not a bad uh, bad idea. Definitely something you should be aware of. Have it in your you know arsenal of tools to pull out. Uh, pull out. The next thing I wanted to show you, and this goes a little bit back to last Friday, um, is now I want to machine around the part. But we're just going to use a standard 2D contour. However, 
you can look at this model here. I kind of applied some fillets um, on uh, some, some chamfers on here. Um, so when you go to select with the 2D contour, so I'm going to have 2D contour, select here, um, then we'll leave it the same 16 millimeter tool, then look at what happens. We can either select this side here, but then we're selecting, we're going to machine away the chamfers. What I actually want is kind of like this, but see how it kind of take this shortest, it's trying to take the shortest route. Um, and I normally would select like the bottom edge, but you can see here that it's not really working. Well, so show it, I want to show it on the top. I'm going to show you a trick. I am going to select this edge, though if you're looking at, I hope this comes through. If you look at the corner, see how I, it actually needs to kind of like blend over to this edge right here. So when I select that, I'm going to select it anyways. Now, this is wrong, okay? But then I'm going to go back and select it again. This is the trick. Then you get that box here where you can now do individual chaining. So now you will see that when I move my mouse over to this edge, look at how it's changing to that edge that I want. So I'm going to left click on that. Now, this area here, Fusion is going to solve that by itself. So don't worry about that area. What I need to just make sure is that I'm selecting that outer edge all the way around. Okay? So select here. It's going, to it's going to blend that by itself because it's still a 2D tool path. I hope that's not confusing. Select that, and then we should be, be back to, to normal. Now, when you've selected that, instead of just hitting OK, make sure you hit the accept the selection. And when you do that, if I go up on the top of it, hopefully you can see how it pads that section between there. So this is the trick to select something a little awkward. So um, if you had never seen that before, go back and, and look at that um, again and, um, and, and, and see how I reselect that same chain and you can now move it around. Hope that's not too confusing. Uh, now notice something here though, I'm just gonna hit okay to it. Um, because I selected here, look at what it does. It's machining the top up here. I actually wanted to machine down here, right? If we go back into the 2D contour, that is because in the height tab, and remember we did a live stream on this in the past, always work from the bottom and up on the height tab. It, it defaults to selected contour. What was that operats that I just selected? But you can always click the drop down and change that to something else. Maybe you select it to model bottom. It means that now we machine down to the blue area. Uh, but of course, if you're holding it in a vise uh, or something else, uh, then you can you can add an offset in here, 15 in here, and now um, now you can you can click that edge right there. Uh, yes, Travis points out that you could also hold down Alt and it will do the, the single edge too. So you, you either double click it or select Alt, that whatever flies your boat. Now uh, you will see here that now I added a 15 millimeter offset from the bottom. So now our tool pad is going to machine around if you're holding on to it in a vise or something, something like that. Two other tricks I want to show you with the contour tool path. Uh, one is if, if we had just had one millimeter around here, this is the finishing pass. I actually normally like to go into the contour tool path, go to the passes tab, and I will turn on roughing pass, but we'll add one more pass. So now you kind of like have one pass that kind of like goes around, kind of like, because sometimes the stock is maybe a saw cut or something, and then the second pass is the finishing tool path. Another thing I do on the contour tool path, you see how it's starting right in the in the middle here. That will always make your cutter kind of like suck into the material. Uh, I talked about this I think last week too. Right click edit, go to the linking tab. The last position down here, we can change where that lead in lead out comes. So just select this point, and uh, now my lead in is going to be right on the corner, and I don't get that suction mark from the cutter. Just makes your part looks a little bit more professional. So just a couple of tips within this. I hope this is useful. Nothing earth shattering. 
but enough of this. Let's um, let's get into some free access. So we actually got to kind of like concentrating on uh, on these six kind of like uh, curved egg shaped uh, holders here. And again, let me know if this is good or bad, like thumbs up or comment area or something like that. You know, is this kind of like good to go through? So we're going to start out roughing these out. We want to remove some of the material in this. And for that, adaptive clearing uh, is, uh, is probably your best option. Now I'm going to click adaptive clearing. And I'm going to give you a little tip that I use is when uh, it comes uh, to, to, to machine with 3D tool path. I select the, the, the tool path I want to use. Make sure I have an end mill I want to use. I'm going to keep this 16 uh, millimeters. Before I change anything else, I'm going to hit OK and see what the software gives me. Okay. Um, this is my preferred way to do 3D toolpath. Before you go in there and start tweaking everything and then you can't figure out what you changed or what affected everything, the easiest thing is select your toolpath, select your tool, hit OK, see what you get. So when I'm looking at this one here, first off, I see that it's machining on the outside of my part. And I'm like, we already finished that up. I don't want to be out here anymore. Well, let's go and attack that. So I'm going to right click on the adaptive, go to edit. And since the outside has probably something to do with the selection, so I'm going to go to the geometry. And you will see here that the machining boundary is set to none. What that really means is that Fusion is just looking at any model that is on the screen uh, and is throwing toolpath on it, but it's great. But um, I don't want to machine the outside. So let's hit the drop down and see some of the options we have. One option is silhouette. Now, when you think of silhouette, just think of a lamp that is shining from the top down, like you had a flashlight in your hand, and anything it's touching, it wants to, to machine uh, that area. So silhouette might work pretty well for this. I'm gonna switch it to silhouette. Again, I'm not gonna do any other changes. I'm just gonna click OK. And let's see what we get. Now, when we look here, we can now see that we are actually not machining the outside. So that is absolutely perfect. So we eliminated one problem. Now, the other thing uh, we have here is look at all these rapid lines. Right? All the yellow lines are rapids between each pocket. Reminds me of going to the mall with my wife at Christmas time. No, maybe that was not funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, we want to eliminate some of these uh, lines. Check this out. Right click, hit edit, go into the passes tab and notice down here there's a checkbox for order by depth or order by area. Let's try to check area because like consider each of these kind of like an area and click OK. Waiting, waiting. Now you will see that it breaks it down. It machines this one, machines this one, and it kind of like goes in a better kind of order, right? So we kind of like eliminate all that running around. Now, let me just zoom in a little bit and look at, at this one here. Um, so this one is pretty good. Um, if we simulate it without the stock for a second, so it goes with the spiral down. That is good. Okay. Now notice that it does have a lot of rapid moves. Look how many times it, it lifts, lifts up as it's machining. And you know, that might actually not be a bad, bad thing. Like if we were machining this out of like steel or something, if you had a cooling nozzle kind of like pointing down there, um, every time that the end mill moves, does that rapid move, it could give the coolant a chance to kind of like flush out the chips. So this might not, uh, might not be a, uh, a bad thing. However, I would like to maybe stop all these yellow lines for going, going up and down. Now, all these yellow rapid lines are really, um, if we go ahead and we look at the tool path, are really not anything with a cutter engaged in material, right? It's between engaging material 
what leads it over to the linking tab. Now over here on the linking tab, if you've ever been in here before, it might look a little, um, it, it looks like there's a lot of different stuff going on here. And by the way, this is my default uh, linking over here. I haven't changed anything. Now, one that when we're doing all these small rapid moves going up and down, one that might be worth to look at is the stay down level. So uh, the least will let it go wherever you want. Uh, the most will try to make it compress it the least amount of rabbits. Rule of thumb, whenever I use this out of the gate, I normally set it to 50%. That way, uh, a lot of this has to do with the calculation. How long does it take fusion to process it? So the more you go most, the more it is going to, the longer it's going to take to, to process this. It's important to remember with the, with the adaptive that one of the awesome things with adaptive is that it really will not gouge your material. So it's using a lot of resources, making sure that it's not gouging the material um, but that can take some, some, some crunching time for your computer. So you can see this is a lot better, right? It does a kind of like a, a some, it's still gonna move around in here. It's not meaning that it's not gonna do some rapids, but it's not moving up and down. It only have like one in here in the beginning and then one to the next pocket. So this is actually pretty good. Now let's go ahead and, um, and simulate this with stock on. So I'm gonna select the whole setup so I get all of them, but I don't really feel feel like, let me go to stock. I'm gonna change that to ceramic. I like this, this look a little bit better. Um, I don't really care about the, the 2D adaptive, uh, the first adaptive facing the outside console. I really wanna go right to the adaptive. So if you click on that, you will actually speed forward right to that. So let's hit play. I'm gonna do that a couple times. And we will see how NML comes in here from our last operation. We will see that it, it um, spirals down, what is great, it's gonna go all the way down, and then it will kinda of like go out and make these staircases, um, what is really good way to rough uh, out these pockets, right? Looks pretty good. Now, one thing I notice right now uh, is that it's actually doing that pocket in two steps. It goes down one step right now, then it's going out, and now it's going up. Notice when it comes to the top, it's just gonna go down one more time right now and go run one step down, one more step. So it's actually making kind of like, it's taking two C depths on this pocket. Let me show you where that is regulated. I'm gonna go back into adaptive, edit, and that has to do with the cutter engaged in the cut. See right here, there's a maximum roughing step down and it's set to 10 what means the cutter will only go 10 millimeters down and do the rough out, but if it's still gotta go deeper to, to, to uh, clear out the pocket, then it has to go deeper. So if I change this to 25, because we have 25 flute length, uh, it can go all the way down to the bottom. Now notice that the fine step down actually changes, for, if before it was one millimeter, now it became two and a half, uh, because it's a tight into the roughing step down. But I actually like that one millimeter step down. So I'm gonna change it back to one millimeter. Hit okay and let's take a look at it now. Let it calculate that. <clears throat> Two seconds. Give me a chance to get a glass of water. It's almost beer time. It's Friday, man. I might run a couple of minutes over here actually today. I thought that I was gonna run faster through this than I was planning on. Okay, simulate. And uh, let's go down to the last adaptive because I think that this is kind of like, I hope this is good stuff. Now, when I simulate, you'll actually see that it's gonna go all the way as far as it has to go down to clear out that pocket because we now let it go all the way down. It doesn't have to go that far down, but now we just kind of like cleaned out um, that area. So now it's just gonna do the whole staircase all the way up and then it's gonna move to the next hole. So be aware, you know, be aware of these options. I'm not really trying to say that all that is, is, is uh, you know, always necessary, but I just wanted to show that that option is there too, if you ever wonder. Okay, enough of adaptive for right now. Um, let's get to the finishing 3D tool path. 
So we've kind of like roughed uh, these pockets out and now we are ready to, uh, to use a finishing toolpath. Now when it comes to 3D toolpath, um, I always start out with the parallel first. Uh, it is right here in the order. Uh, the parallel cut is good old mold maker toolpath. Select that. Now we're gonna go over and select the ball end mill because that's what we're always using to finish with 3D um, toolpaths, or finishing toolpath. Scroll down to the bottom. And in here we have a six millimeter ball end mill. Select that. And again, like I said before, when it comes to 3D toolpath, I select my tool and uh, then I click OK. And see what the heck I get. And we actually get a pretty nice toolpath, right? You can kind of like see the parallel kind of like cuts parallel across our part. Um, of course, we already kind of finished the top, so I don't really need the top. So I'm going to go back into the toolpath and do just like we did before when we machined on the outside with the adaptive. That has to be with selection. So this again is using silhouette, but it's like a lamp, a flashlight sliding right down. What if I choose selection and I'm just going to select this one pocket for right now and hit OK. Then it's just going to do uh, that, that pocket there. Now the step over here is a little bit big. Um, and when it comes to step overs, right now it's set to three millimeters. It's, it's super easy, people. The finer you make your step over, the nicer it's going to look, but the longer it's going to take, right? Uh, so um, you really have to find out what, what works the best for you. I would probably never, ever start out with anything bigger than a half a millimeter or something like this. Just start out with that and see see how it looks. So this actually looks pretty good. Uh, it's a pretty nice looking tool path. What you will notice though, is that when we look up the side, the step over here is pretty, is bigger than it is uh, down here. It's because it's kind of like using the, the ball and mill to figure it out. But if we go in to simulate this with the stock on, oops, let's just go select the entire thing, simulate, speed forward to the parallel cuts. If we go in here and we start simulating this, spin it around here, speed it up a little bit. Ooh, I'm noticing something. Are you noticing something? See how it looks like there's gouge mark up on the top? Hmm, suspicious? Well, you know what? I did that on purpose. You gotta remember, if you are going to use the adaptive as a facing operation, that by default adaptive have stock to leave on, right? Because it's kind of considered a roughing tool, but if you're gonna use it as a facing, make sure you turn that off. <laughs> I planned that. I am sneaky. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and simulate this. Um, and speed it up a little bit. And we can kind of like see the step overs. Now, the step overs that you, that you see in here, these step overs here, uh, that resembles pretty well what you actually are going to see also on, on your part. Um, however, just remember right now that look how close we actually are looking at this part right now, right? Like this is literally like if we had that part like right here and looked at it like very close. So um, just remember when you're looking at gouging, like this looks a lot wavy, but in real life, uh, we might just be looking at it, you know, a little bit out. Uh, but I still see this. So this is not my, my favorite tool path for, for this year. And I actually also see another thing I want to point out. If I rotate it around, look how much material the adaptive left down here. See that? I hope that shows up on your screen very well. And that is simply because we selected for the adaptive over here, we selected a 16 millimeter end mill, and that's going to have to leave all this material. So we might actually want to go a little bit with a smaller um, cutter in here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to do something here. I'm going to right click on this parallel cut and I'm going to suppress it. 
so now it's going to be kind of like like you suppress a feature inside of Fusion, meaning that this toolpath uh, is like it's it's not there right now. We haven't deleted it, but we're not using it. So let's use an adaptive to go a little bit further down in these pockets. However, when we if we go up and we do another adaptive up here, um, remember we did a bunch of changes to like uh, we did the we, we did uh, order by area, we changed the, the rabbit's heights and different things like that. All that will be, you know, we will reset all that if we're just selecting a new adaptive clearing. What we can do is we can right click right here on adaptive and we can do a create derived operation. So right click on the adaptive and say create derived operation and select another adaptive clearing. That means we are covering all those settings over uh, from from before. I am gonna run a little late today, but it's Friday, so you get a little bit extra for your for your mission here. Um, I'm gonna go with a smaller cutter though, because that's the problem. That's the reason it didn't go so deep. So I'm gonna select another cutter, and let's go down to our tutorial down here, and we could select as a five millimeter flat end mill, whatever you have, right? Select that, um, and then so so. What we now have is we go to geometry, you will see that that was set to silhouette because that was what we changed. We also changed order by area. We also changed the, like all those things have been copied over now because we use that uh, derived. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the geometry tab and there's something called rest machining. And if I select rest machining, and it's, it's default turned on with from setup of stock. But if I change that to previous operation and hit OK, I actually get a warning that the 25 millimeters that I have on my depth over on the passes tab um, exceeds the flute length on this 5 millimeter cutter. So Fusion has this intelligence in it. It looked ahead and says, whoa. Are you sure that you want to keep that at 25? Because you only have 10 millimeter fluid length. We're probably okay here. Um, so I'm going to, but I'm still going to say no. And I'm going to go ahead and change that back to 10, uh, what it was before, for, because we're using the five millimeter corner here. Okay, let's start to hit okay now. So what rest machining does, and I'm going to do a live stream further later on on rest machining. What rest machining does is it looks at the previous operation, and we can we can move it up here by dragging it up on top. It's going to look at the previous operation, what is the, the previous adaptive, and it is going to make see what have been cut there and what have not been cut, so it's not wasting time machining areas that have already been machined. Now, for this specific scenario, because we're in this comb area, uh, the software is is sensitive. Uh, so you will like to see here that it will pick up some weird moves up on top where the, the previous adaptive ran just because it kind of like sees the steps from there and it looks it looks a little crazy but of course there's a workaround for this if you right click and go into edit all you have to do is just change your stock to leave um, a little bit so if I just go to one millimeter you will now see that that is going to be uh, not be the case anymore because it's not seeing uh, that area. So just a little a little tip there. Just waiting for the for the um, toolpath to generate here. So now you can see that we are getting only that bottom area cleaned out because. The top was cleaned out with, with, with that, okay? So uh, now when we go in and, and simulate uh, our finishing toolpath, you will see that we don't leave so much stock. So that was another tip. Okay, so uh, let's wrap this up. So the parallel cut, um, I kind of like that, but I don't like how it left the sides here. So let's go in and try something else. Contour toolpath might actually be uh, the next favorable one um, because it really likes steep areas, what was kind of the area we had in here. So let's select contour, leaving it the six uh, millimeter ball end mill. Again, I'm just gonna hit okay and see what I get, <laughs> right? 
That's what I like to do. It's going to take two seconds to generate. It's not too bad. And that actually looks pretty nice, right? That is a very uniform uh, tool path here. But look down at the bottom. It's kind of like almost doing uh, the opposite than it did up here uh, on the parallel. When it comes down to the bottom, it doesn't really like flat places. And that's actually why in the olden days, when I started <laughs> using CAM, we will combine the two. Uh, run one and then run the other. But let me show you on the simulation what I'm, how it would look like in uh, at the end. So it actually does a very nice job here at the top. The step over might be a little bit big here. Um, I didn't check the step over. But it does a nice job up here unified. Um, but then you will see when it comes down to the flat area, it kind of like, it kind of like, gets lazy and just kind of like wraps it up right there. Can you see that? How it's kind of like just leaving a stock there. And that's why I'm saying that in the past, we many times would run both toolpath and that would kind of like equals it out. Or you would even try to trim them together so you didn't cut the same places twice, whatever. So contour maybe is not the right toolpath for this either. Uh, but you kind of like saw what it can do. So I am gonna go and suppress that too. Next one, you might want to use the ramp. So the difference between the contour and the ramp is that the contour will do one full circle, go down, one full circle, go down. The ramp tool will do kind of like more like a ramping thing, corkscrew style. But it's actually going to end up leaving the same thing at the bottom as the contour. So for this shape, um, and that's because we're kind of like doing both. We're doing, like if we were just doing a straight wall area, both contour and ramp would be great. But because we have that curved, it's not, it's not uh, fantastic. Let's go here and look at the next one. So that contour, the ramp, nope. Horizontal would not really apply for this. Only looking for flat areas. Pencil is a finishing tool path. Not really great either. Now the scallop tool... Uh, might be an interesting one. Let's try that one. So I'm going to select scallop and um, I'm just going to hit OK. We have still have the six millimeter ball and mill selected here. And you will see if we're looking at our egg shape, that looks very weird. Well, that's because the scallop kind of like collapses from the outer inwards in this case. So it starts from the out and it kind of like just collapses with an equal step over towards the center uh, of this. Well, what happens though if we right click, hit edit, and instead of doing silhouette, doing selection, hit OK. Now that looks maybe a little bit better. Let's uh, try to go with a little bit smaller step over just to really get a a better uh, idea. So that's the passes tab and it's set to three. And like I said, I would never start out with anything bigger than 0.5, I think. And that there actually looks like a very nice tool path, right? Like it is consistent all the, all the, the way down uh, to, to the end there. So that would probably be my choice for this. Now, of course, it's only machining one. So let's go in and right click and hit edit, go back to selection and uh, let's select the remaining pockets here. Like that, hit OK. In the process. And that should do it right there, folks. That should be, I think, a pretty nice uh, looking tool path. Now with this done here, uh, these two other tool paths that I kind of like suppressed, I maybe just choose to shift select them both, right click, and uh, we could just delete them, right? We don't maybe don't need them anymore. We found the tool path uh, we want. So I hope that uh, you found this helpful. Hope I showed you some things that you may not have seen before, uh, some things that maybe would would help you in your endeavor into uh, into into camp. 
So that was what I was planning on showing on this Friday. We ran over about 10 minutes. I am so sorry. I hope that didn't hold you away from your beer. Um, but let me know in the comment area if how useful this is, uh, if we want to do more of these kind of things, or if you rather want to be more on a specific like geometry selection or passes tab instead of here where I'm kind of like just took you through like the process how I would program it. That's it, folks. <clears throat> Hope you have an awesome weekend planned. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch these. I will be back on Monday. I hope that you will be there too. I'm going to do what I normally do. I am going to end the recording. So if you're watching that, thank you so much. Thumbs up, thumbs down, be honest. And I'm going to jump into the live stream chat and say hi to everybody. Take care, guys.